So, idea number one. Idea number one is that um, in physics, have you ever heard of the word voltage in physics? Right? And so you might have the concept of the voltage. Have you heard of the word current? You might have the concept of current. And have you heard of the word frequency? Hertz. They're very simple concepts in year 12 that, and, and first year too. You know, that you're going to need. Now, have you ever heard of devices, right? You've heard of transistors and all those types of things? Yes or no? Who's heard of a transistor? No. Oh, wow. Put your hand up clearly so we can see Stefan. This is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Do you get me? We're quite interested. We're wondering what Hi, teachers out there. We're wondering what you're teaching your students. Maybe you're teaching them about, oh, let's go to the moon in a rocket or Mars in a rocket and all these types of things. Maybe also let's teach them some basics, right? You know, it's just a little bit of a reminder. Okay, I'm going to go really to the basic, basic, basic devices. So have you ever heard of a resistor? Yeah, resistance. Okay, so we've got the word resistor. Okay. Have you ever heard of the word capacitor? Wow, okay. So, a capacitor. And now I'm going to have one, going to have one more word. I don't say gunner when it's recording, Steve. You can remove gunner, right? Right. I am going to, right? Gonna okay. do it later. You're going to do it later? Okay, thank you. Right. You know, we can have some bloopers on this, I'm sure. What's the other word that goes with these ones? We've got resistors, capacitors. Somebody know? All right. Okay. I'm going to simply call it an inductor. Now, I can actually tell you that at your level, in strangely, this is easy for you to understand. Conceptually, this you can understand. And strangely, you understand this, but don't realize you understand this yet. And you won't be taught about this, but I'm going to show you some resistors, some capacitors, and some inductors. And I'm going to remind you that if you understand the basic things that are happening in this device, then you can understand your year 12 physics very nicely and use it in your first year physics uh, as you go further. All right. And then there are some words that go together with these. And there is the word potential. Now. You guys have all heard of potential energy, haven't you? Like you take a brick and lift it. Have you heard of the electric potential and the EMF, the electromotive force and everything? Okay. And have you heard of the word charge? Yes or no? Yes. Who's seen a charge? What do you mean no? What do you mean no, Stephen? Okay. Who's felt a charge? You've never brushed against something and felt static electricity? Right? Do you get me? There are such simple things you do, right? Get a balloon and rub it and then put it against the wall and it sticks and have a think about why does it stick, right? That's why you learn physics. And then finally, there is a word. Now, this one is going to be a strange word, fields. Anyone think of any fields that you've experienced? Magnetic. magnetic field. Perfect. I saw Steve had a magnet. Where's where's the magnet? Over there. Perfect. Have we got a um got a drawing pin, Steve? Yeah. Here we go. Maybe maybe this will work. I don't know. Oh yeah, here we go. Here's a pen. Here's a pen. And look at the magic. Look at the magic. I can use this piece of paper and Look at that, I can pick that pen up with this piece of paper. Right, of course I can do magic. You know, I've got this piece of steel inside this piece of paper, apparently. And this piece of steel, because it's painted blue and red, apparently it's got special properties. Right? And the most amazing thing is that you've... Ex oh, sorry. Sorry, I should be back there. Uh, Jacinta's telling me to be back in the microphone. Or oh, Steve. Yeah. Come on, Steve. Come on, Jacinta. That's much better. Is that right? Okay, we're trying to get this right, okay? 
Yeah, actually, this is my better side of my face. Do you get me? That's the, this is the intelligent side of my face. This is not the intelligent side, and this is definitely not the intelligent front, okay? Um, how many people have played with a magnet? Hey, just to put that question out there, but how many people have played with a magnet? Great, because that's the most fun you can have. Do you realize a magnet can weigh things? Do you realize the magnet, I can get um, magnetic filings out of this and get into my finger, get splinters from a magnet too. All right, so we'll look at how, well, here's something we're going to weigh later on. Steve, I'll distort that by just putting that there temporarily just to annoy you. Okay. All right, so on here are the words for year 12 that if you actually understood these words, that would be really useful. And in fact, there is going to be a formula that will be discussed in the next lecture, I think, that uh, relates the voltage, the current, and the resistance. And understanding that, and then building upon that. Today's lecture is not about doing those types of formulae. It's about engaging you to think about what's going on. Um, so what do we want to measure? We want to measure volume, height, weight, mass, color, temperature, age, pressure, and frequency. And I would argue that with a resistor, a capacitor, and an inductor arranged in the right way, we can do all of those things. But now I'm going to ask you something. What is the difference between a resistor, a capacitor, and an inductor. Now, you know the sad thing about these questions is these are questions that you're not taught the answers to. These are real questions. These are questions we have to think. And Steve's thinking about whether the camera's marked up again. Anyone? Do you know how you make a resistor? Anyone? Mike, when you've got to go, you go. You sneak out. Yeah. Where are you going to? Tell everybody. Actually, put camera on him so everyone can wave goodbye from Queensland. <laughs> He's going to a mathematics lecture, right? And so he came across here. See you later. Right. Okay. We're back to here. All right. So what is the resistor? Somebody? Come on. I mean, you guys, you're studying physics. And you've done this in year 11, haven't you? Actually, you've forgotten that you've done this in year 11. You also did this probably in grade five or six when you built a little circuit with a light, you know? Anyone? Steve, help me out. Uh, resistor has resistance. Yeah, how could you argue with that? Um, What's resistance mean? It's like... Uh, electricity current is like, a, like water current and resistor is like stored within the resistor. Oh, your teacher's told you to say that, hasn't Is that right? We've got resistor reduces the flow of current in a circuit. Excellent. Okay. Or a resistor enables the flow of the current in a circuit. And the, the better it is at allowing that current, the lower its resistance to allowing the current to flow. So we think of the language. And um, to have current flow, and I guarantee you can't see this on the video, so I'll just come up nice there. I've got a roll of copper wire, right? And that is a conductor. So I, I didn't put up there conductors and insulators, so I'm going to ignore insulators for the time being. I'm interested in how electricity moves or conducts, right? So I reckon I can take a conductor like carbon, and make a resistor, right? I reckon I can take a conductor like copper and make a capacitor. And I reckon I can take a conductor like steel and make an inductor. So if I was silly at this point, I would say resistors are made of carbon, capacitors are made of copper, and inductors are made of steel. And therefore, I know what the difference is. These different elements make these different things. Let me flip this around to you. I can take copper in the form of a wire, 
and stretch it out. And the longer I make the wire, the more resistance it has because the current, it's harder for the current to flow. And so by stretching a wire out, I can make a resistor. I can take copper and flatten it and make two parallel plates of copper and I can store charge on those plates. And there's one, where is it, Steve? Over there, yeah. I can store charge on those plates and make a capacitor. Or I can take copper and I can coil it up and when I pass a current in it, like this coil here, it is an induct, oh, sorry, Steve's got to wake up, hang on. <laughs> and uh, I can go over here. Oh no, sorry, Steve, I was trying to follow you. Okay, Steve, and I can go, are they, are they complaining yet on the chat? I'm getting seasick. Yeah, yeah Steve, Steve's camera work is driving us um, insane. I, I am very sedate for me, by the way. This is normally, you know, it's very hard for me to be so calm and cool on lecturing. And I've got coils of copper wire in here, and they are an inductor. Hey, um, what's the difference between a resistor, a capacitor, and an inductor? Anyone? Is it the element? I've just told you it's not. What was the difference between the wire, the flat plate, and the coil? What word would you use to define that difference? Come on, you're in a small class, no one will know. Have you ever heard of the word geometry? All right? Isabella said the shape. Yeah, shape, the geometry. Thanks, Isabella. It's really good. And it's pretty exciting for in physics when you suddenly learn that geometry can actually give conductors these properties. And then when we pass a voltage across a res or through a resistor or pass a current or you know or store charge, use a voltage to store charge, or turn something on and off in an inductor when we can make a circuit that resonates we suddenly have these devices that can do measurement. And these are the reasons, these are the basic principles in physics that we teach in physics year 12. This is why we teach you very simple laws, like you will learn about Ohm's law and Coulomb's law, and you learn about the forces at F equals QE, you learn about F equals BIL sine theta. Actually, you don't learn about the sine theta in year 12, do they? They just learn about parallel, you know, also a perpendicular fields and that, and you learn these things about forces and fields. And the reason for that is because nearly everything we want to measure in our real world can be brought back to here. Now, I just want to go back to that digital side, so the phone. All right. All right, so let's, um, can the phone, Measure my volume. Steve, you, you, Steve, you're in charge, okay? You, yes or no? Can the phone measure my volume? Yes. How? Uh, when you record it, some apps can like show how high and when your volume goes high, it feels like high peak. Yeah. When it goes down, it feels like oh. Yeah. And it gives me an accurate measure of my volume, does it? Not in numbers. Okay, not in numbers. Can it measure my height? You see, my question to you is you live in this world where you believe this damn device and I'll download an app to measure velocity or I'll tell you what the temperature, everyone can tell me. I'll say, oh, how hot is it in here? And someone will look up their app and say, oh, it's, it's, um, it's 23 degrees or something like that. And I'm saying, well, how do you know that? Oh, I looked it up on an app. Well, is there a thermometer in this room that's suddenly connected to that app? Or is that a, a guesstimate or something from another device somewhere else in the world? Do you get me? And so I would like to challenge you that all of the measurements that this device makes are effectively analog. And then it renders them in a digital world and says, hey, look at that. I can draw you a nice picture and show you everything else like that. So do we have any questions, Jacinta? Yeah. No? Okay. Well, all right. So... Steve's got some demos. 
that we'd like to show you some behavior of some simple things. So here's a scale. Steve, can I pull it across? I'll, yeah, I'll pull, it, I'll pull it over and we'll see how we go. And so now, by the way, did you notice how far into the basement of the physics department? Stefan, you've never seen this, have you? Like, it's just beautiful piece of work. So what I've got here is some weights, right? And um, I, don't, I don't think they are magnetic, actually. That's interesting. So there's stainless steel. Let me just check my magnet. Yeah, my magnet's pretty good. See that? Yep, that's a good magnet. All right. And um, as I mentioned, I've got a coil here. And... I've actually got another coil down here and I've got this connected to this power supply. Steve's got it facing me. So this is a very modern power supply, right? Okay, so this can make a voltage and I can turn this knob to actually increase or decrease the voltage. Watch what happens, by the way, if I let this go. So here, I'll let this thing go. And, oh my gosh, it keeps falling down this side. So what can I infer from this right now? And by the way, I'll just disconnect this so that there's no ambiguity about this. Which side is heavier, this side or that side? Well, it's clearly this side because let me lift this up. Do you see how much heavier that is? It's, it's heavy on that side. Now, I'm going to put an extra weight in here and balance this up very carefully. And, and you can see, Steve, are you in on there? Is it? Can you guys see that that's pretty well balanced? All right. And I mean, it's moving a little bit. So if I add an extra weight on this side, so I've got this tiny weight. Steve's gone in on that. Is that, is that on your hand there, Steve? I've got this tiny weight. And Steve, is this one, five grams, is it, or something? Or? Yeah, a couple of grams. Two grams, right? And if I put two grams on this side, it pushes it down. And if I put the two grams on this side, it'll push it in that direction. Does that make sense? Now watch this. So there we go. And it's now hitting on this side. Let's pull that down. Now what I'm going to do is I am going to pass a current through that coil. And the interesting thing is that I have a similar current passing through the other coil. Hello, can you, can, hi oh, Steve, so if you turn your volume down now. Okay. All right. And I'm waiting for Steve to turn his volume down so that I know I can be heard. Stefan, just remember this is what it's like on these things. Okay. Yeah, James is saying you're muted. You're on mute. You're on mute. Jacinta, I'm muted. Can anyone else hear me, Ben? Am I clear now? Yeah. <laughs> all right, Ben James, thank you. I can hear you. Okay, excellent. All right, so we're, we're alive. You guys can see me. So, this amazing task we have here is this scale. 
And um, and on on this side of the scale over here, I had I put a tiny little extra weight, and we see that the scale has come down to here and pushed this right across. And if only I could apply a force back to here, I could mute. I could bring that back. And Steve's going to set that up. Steve, you're back alive. Steve's still thinking about it. And um, Jacinta's going to try this. So just pull out a touch further, Jacinta, in front. Actually, so if you pull out a touch further and then tilt, uh, tilt this way and then and to here so that we get those two. All right. Okay. And now I'm going to turn this power supply on. Actually, let me, let me, let me just. Let me just, sorry, I meant to balance that up. I just balance this up first. All right, so that's nicely balanced. And then put that into there. And then it's jammed. Here we go, Steve. It's good that you're back a while yet, Steve. Yeah, it's dead again. And now I'm going to turn the voltage up. Turn the voltage up, he says, coming down. Steve, this is one of these classic things. Oh, Lost power. Oh, Steve, what's happened with lost power? That's what's happened. Oh, hang on. <laughs> right. Now, we always <laughs> say, actually, we, we had chemistry before. Let me just tell you. If it runs around and smells, right? If it runs around and smells, it's biology. Uh, biology. If it just smells, it's chemistry. And if it doesn't work, it's Physics. Physics. All right. Okay. So we always say that. So poor Steve is worried about this. Let me just have a look. So I've got I've got this power supply, and now I'm going to apply the current. Here we go. I finally got a current flowing through there. And what we're trying to do, Steve, you're having any luck, Steve? Or not yet? Steve claims he's on. Do we believe Steve? All right. In the meantime, I'm going to go there. I'm going to turn that current up. Tell me, just center and we're moving. Here we go. Oops. And we just lost power there. We overloaded. Yeah, I know. Thank you. And it's about there. And if I measure that current right now, that current is 12 volts and 16 amps running through there right now. And if I worked it out, come to Melbourne University and we will tell you to count these numbers of turns. And so from the current and voltage that we pass through that coil, we could work out the mass of this tiny little thing and make a measurement. And then we could build an app around it and then put it on your phone and then you shine it at this thing and it tells you how much it weighs. All right? So there's nothing magic. Steve, you alive? You're okay? Yeah. All right. Okay. So we go to Steve? I'll, I'll pop over, yeah. All right. And um, I'm, I'm not sure if I need advice as to whether Steve's mic is working. Yeah, okay, it's good to see. Yeah. All right. <sighs> you guys have been such a great audience for making so much noise for you. Know, like, so I can, we have a question. Is yeah. that an electromagnet? Excellent. An electromagnet is exactly what it is. So, what's an electromagnet? So, let me actually move this a bit further away. And here's an experiment you can do at home. This is actually safe for you to do at home. You firstly go to Mitre 10 or Bunnings and you ask them for one name. You ask them for one name. They won't give it to you, but try your hardest. You then get a piece of wire, insulated wire, and you grab that wire and you wrap it around the nail. Right? And then you peel off the insulation and you get a D cell 1.5 volt battery. And so you get a battery, D cell battery plus 1.5 volts, actually plus minus. You get it? it doesn't matter, plus minus, whatever. And you connect this part to there and you connect that part to there. And you get yourself a paper clip and you bring that tip near the paper clip and you've made yourself an electromagnet. That's simple. Now that's quite safe for you to do at home. Very, very simple experiment. And then you break the current 
and the paper clip will fall. So then you turn the current back on and the paper clip will attract it. And what you've done is you set up a circuit through which you've passed a current. Now, actually, in physics, we're going to get really annoying in life and physics. Notice I'm showing the current going from positive to negative. You're going to learn the thing about convention in physics. And sometimes we like to talk about current with positive charge carriers, but we know there are electrons flowing, and we know the electron current is in the reverse direction. You're going to have to learn to live with that. Right? Anyway, and so that current flows, and you can make a magnetic field in this device because you've coiled this wire around it. You can actually, so that's the electromagnet. Was that the question? Yep. So this is an electromagnet, and it's it's a magnet because electrons are flowing to make the magnetism. By the way, is this device an electromagnet? No, it's a permanent magnet. And how that's being magnetized is that there are domains or uh, charge distributions in this or dipole distributions that have been aligned all together to make this side predominantly north and this side predominantly south. Hey, um, this is a great question that we sometimes ask our students. I'll tell you because it'd be great if you remember. Hey, I've got this magnet. And um, I grab this magnet, and imagine the red is the north, and the blue is the south pole. And I uh, grab another magnet. I don't have red. Oh, here we go. I've got red. Here's another magnet, right? And so that's that's red, uh, north and south. I know that if I try to bring these two north poles together, do they attract or repel? Repel, you've learned that. Isn't that great? And if I do the south pole like that, do they attract or repel? Right. Now, I want you to pretend that you can't see those little bits like that. And can you see I've got a north pole and a south pole in my magnet? Okay. All right. Now, imagine I broke that magnet apart. I'd be back to this question I asked you. So I wonder, if I took this magnet, and cut it in half, would I end up with one north magnet and one south magnet? Who said no? Yep. What would I end up with? And then what if I took the smaller magnets and cut them in half again? And if I cut them in half again? And okay, isn't that beautiful? Because there's something magic about physics, about magnets. Remember, they're the things you guys have already studied. So electromagnets, by the way, the electromagnet is a bit interesting. If, if indeed, I'll go back to this electromagnet. Remember, this lecture, I said there's no slides, there's no nothing. I take it wherever you like because I want you to work out that you can say this well. So if indeed I say that's north and that's south, I can get away with this step because I haven't specified how I want to call this. I thought I'd just wait this <laughs> I'm not going to do it live. The nice thing that happens is if I grab, if I grab this battery and turn it upside down and connect it that way, this becomes south and that becomes north. And so something tells me that north and south poles tell me something about maybe. How the current, oh, by the way, I'm going to turn that down, the current flows in the other direction. And it tells me about how the current might be flowing through this device. Now that's that's magnetism and that's magnetic fields. What about charges? Stephen, you said you've never seen a charge. Would you like to see a charge? All right, okay, Steve, let's organize the charge for Stephen. So I'm going to pull this out of the way. Oh, uh, uh, okay. No, wrong charge. I was thinking the blue charge. We get a blue charge? Yeah, blue charge. Yeah, do you prefer blue? Yeah, we have blue charges, right? All right. Uh, it's just the way you want to paint your white. I did Right? 
Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Okay. All right. So I'm going to describe this very simple device to you. Have you guys ever seen something like this? So this device is going to have one of those nasty oh I've got it in my houses. Do you have incandescent lamps or LEDs now? Who's got LEDs? I know. No one's got incandescent lamps. No one knows how light works anymore. Do you? Do you know how an LED works? When you put the thing up, it's so complicated inside, yet it's simple, right? You get it? Come and study physics and explain it. But here's how all lights used to work. Edison invented the light bulb, right? You get it? And Edison, once again, got a battery, and we could use a 1.5 volt battery. And Edison got a glass bulb and put wire and basically connected the power to that and when the current flowed through that the current made that get hot and that radiated and that glowed that's what radiation means and so what Steve has set up by the way is a light bulb in here that will glow now that light bulb will glow, and by glowing, think about what happens. The temperature of this thing increases. When it increases, the atoms vibrate because the temperature is getting hot. And you reckon the atom, what's the atom made up of? Remind me. Somebody. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Let's stop there. That's good enough. We don't have any particles to sit there. I'd get upset. <laughs> Which do you reckon when you vibrate an atom will fall off first? The proton, the neutron, or the electron? I'll give you an example. Once again, you guys have a unique opportunity to start to think about what you're learning. So we've got um, the group up in uh, Brizzy, we've got the Gather, or down here we've got the MCG. You remember the MCG where the women's league play football and stuff like that, right? The WAFL? I want you to imagine the MCG is the atom. So right in the middle of the MCG, if you put six red jelly beans and six blue jelly beans right in the middle there, about the size of a golf ball, that is the nucleus of carbon, carbon-12. The six red jelly beans are the six protons, and the six blue jelly beans are the six neutrons. And that's carbon. And then in the outer, in the outer, we put six specks of dust, tiny specks of dust, the tiniest speck that you can't even see, and they're the electrons. Do you get a feel for what the atoms made of? The mass is all in the middle in these protons and neutrons, and then in the specks on the outside are the electrons. By the way, the easiest ones to get rid of are throw the electrons away. So when this thing gets hot, we're going to throw all the electrons off. Then Steve's been naughty. He's set up, and actually Steve can go on because hopefully the um, our friends on the net can actually see the voltages that we're about to use. So we're going to set up 5,000 volts. Now that's a lot. Don't do this at home. So this is about a few volts, 10 volts, 100 volts, to make this thing glow. And then there's electrons spinning off everywhere, and this will make this class bigger for this thing. And then Steve is going to set up about 5,000 volts of difference between here and here, and those electrons are going to go streaming along there. So I'm just going to turn it on. Steve, which one? That one. Yeah. This one? Yeah, that one. Yeah. You sure I'm not going to blow this up? Sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. And you see that glowing? Can you guys see the white glowing? Shall I turn the light down and touch it? Or? Yeah. Okay. All right. So, Steve, you're clear on that? You see that coming through? Yep. So, the bit, I've got to be careful, it's 5,000 volts here. This bit that's glowing is what's called the filament and letting, letting electrons off. Now, Steve, I'm going to try to accelerate these electrons. Is that the correct direction, Steve? Oh, there we go. 
And you see those electrons are blue. Forget about them being blue. We've got a bit of a gas in there so that we can see them. Actually, they're striking a phosphorescent screen. And can you see that the electrons are there? Let me just decrease your energy. You know, if I give them about 5,000 volts of kinetic energy, they come all the way there. Hey, wow, look, the electrons are magnetic. All right. Oh, Steve, I've got a crystal. Whoa! See that? There's that iron ready. Now, watch this. Mm. Hang on. I'm trying to bend the electrons. Hang on. Ah. Oh. But hang on, I'm trying to bend the electrons towards me, but they go down. Hang on, they go up. Isn't that amazing? So somehow the electrons interact perpendicular with the magnetism. And that's a very important thing. And by the way, student, you're going to spend all your lives doing this, trying to work out the force, velocity, and you know, fields with an electron and all those things. Now I'm going to turn on another thing because above here. And below here, I've got two plates, and they're like a capacitor for what they're worth. And I can put a voltage and bend those electrons in those parallel plates. And so, Steve, we're going to turn. Oops. No. Yeah. Oh, it is. It is running. So, Steve. Ah, that's why. All right. So, let me disconnect that. That's the straight thing going through. I was wondering why I was bending a little bit before. Through the positive aspect, yeah, okay. All right, I'm going to turn. Whoa. So now, using a voltage, I can actually adjust the path of electrons, or I can do this. Now, watch this. Now, this is naughty. Steve's going to get upset. I'm going to disconnect this. Steve, you're cool. Yeah, it looks, it doesn't look too worried. Okay, I'm going to remove the voltage. There we go, and it comes back. I'm going to reverse the voltage. So I'm going to move. Black to red, and I'm going to put red to black, and it goes up. Very, very simple thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Perfect. I love that. I love that. I love that. So now I've got electrons flowing in this direction. I use the voltage to give them kinetic energy. You get me? Get them energy. I've used an electric field to bend them up. And then Stefan's not asking for much. He wants me to actually correct them and bend them back down. And, and there we go. And now I've got an amazing balance between the electric field and the magnetic field. And this device, by the way, becomes a spectrometer. And we can use this to identify drugs, and all other things in 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 sort of like you know amazing chemicals and whatever. And once again, you can get an app, you're gonna shine at something digital, and behind the scenes will be an analog voltage and an and then incandescent light and make all these things. Now I'm not saying digital is not important. However, the physics that you learn in year 12, you can explain every single aspect of this behavior of this device. Pretty exciting, isn't it? And I love the device. Actually, we had um, we had an old Telefunken um, valve that we used to use, but this one's much better. Thanks, Steve. That's great. Are you excited? Yep. You know, you're happy now that your um, computer's not working. Yet. Our computer's working again. Whatever. Okay. I love plug this. Let's see how we go for time. One minute. One minute. We've got any Oh, one minute. You guys are going to be kidding. That's the official time. Oh, but, you know. Time. Okay. All right. So we lost. We lost two and a half minutes. Steve lost the camera. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm going to talk you through this device because I want you to realize the simplicity of things. So, in summarizing, we've worked out that we can make resistors, capacitors, and inductors, right? So, I'm going to talk you through the rest of the devices and explain to you how they work. So when you want to measure a voltage, one way of doing it is to put into your circuit a coil of wire, and if there is a voltage present, the current will flow in the coil of wire. And in that, in that coil of wire, the coil of wire will make a magnet 
a, a magnetic field. But then if you put a magnet near there, depending on the polarity of that magnet, you'll get a force on that coil of wire. Does that make sense? And so imagine you had, is that it backwards, Steve? Yeah, I'm yeah. oh, sorry. Hang on. <laughs> I feel like in one of those shows, you know, we turn around. <laughs> so this device is a very carefully balanced needle with a spring. There's a coil of wire. So you can see it's probably pretty hard to see, but there's a coil of wire in there, and right in the middle there's a magnet. And if I provide a voltage between here, there will be a current that flows, it'll make a magnetic field, and then that will react against the permanent magnet. And Steve's got a power supply here, and I need to find it's okay, Steve. Right up this moment. Yep, on there. Where? Right. And we've got a power supply here. Where is it? Ignore these two. It's on the other side. Yep, yep, yep. Get in there. This one? Yep, yep. yep, that's cool. Okay, whoa! And so there's the voltage from this being measured using the simple laws of physics. You pass a current through a coil, the coil reacts against a magnetic field. There's a spring to provide a force back. Hook's law, remember? F equals kx. And actually, Stefan, that was beautiful because we balance forces to neutralize those. And that's the same way here. You're seeing that. And here's what I would predict. If I reverse the current, I wonder if the needle will go in the other direction. Right? And then um, here is a long copper wire. It's actually not copper, it's steel. And by moving along there and making the current go through many, many more turns, this is a resistor, which is a variable resistor. I can decrease the voltage, right? Because I put in series. You see the oops, whoops. Oh. Yeah, that was interesting. I saw that. Okay. The other thing I could do now, actually, I won't do it with this one. Imagine I connected a circuit like that and I mounted this on a wall. Yeah. And I mounted this on a wall and I had something that I could adjust this to match my head. And I measured the voltage here and I calibrated that voltage. I could measure height with this. You get me? And once again, we're in the complete analog world. And then um, these, these are the types of meters that we've used all our lives. Finally, there's a device that's sitting over there I'm not going to get, but I'm going to make, I'm going to make the observation. If I get two parallel plates of a conductor and I store a charge on that parallel plate, I can actually measure that charge because I get a, a voltage, an electromagnet, an EMF on that parallel plate. The one thing I found, by the way, is that the further apart I take those plates, or the closer I bring them together, that voltage changes. And imagine you wanted to measure sound. So you would take two tiny little plates and you would actually put them in a device like this called a microphone. And you would actually put a small amount of charge there. And then whoa, when you vibrate that plate, that plate goes closer and closer together and further and further apart. And you'll get a small voltage that's induced from that. And that's how one microphone works. But we don't have to stop there. Do you remember Faraday's law? Do you guys study Faraday's law yet or not? About magnetism, anything? Actually, do you know what happens here? So we had the, um, yeah, we've got the coil of wire and we've got the magnet. Now, there's a nice thing about physics. Things can be reversed often, often, not always. Not always, but generally speaking. So I can take a coil, oh, this is a coil of wire, and I can put a current through that coil of wire and I can make a magnet. That's great. 
and I can remove the current, the voltage, and the magnet goes away. The other thing I can do is I can grab a magnet and pass it back and forth through a coil of wire. And the interesting thing happens is you make electricity, right? So imagine you have a magnet and you have a coil of wire around that magnet. I'll just make it that way. And you put a big piece of paper or aluminium there. And through this coil of wire, you pass a current that changes, alternates back and forth. And maybe there's a spring here. Can you see when the magnet's strong, it might pull towards and push away with the current changing? And that's what a loudspeaker is. And the inverse is also true, that if you take a tiny magnet and a tiny coil of wire, and you put a tiny piece of paper, and it's suspended with a spring, and you speak at it and it vibrates back and forth, it actually makes electricity, and that's a dynamic microphone. And all of these are based on the simple laws of physics. The simple laws that if you understand how a voltage, how a current interacts in a resistor, in a capacitor, in an inductor, you're well on the way to understanding the majority of the electric part of the U12 course. Now you guys have been so exciting because you made so much noise. <laughs> We've time for a couple of quick questions. Yeah. You see yep, I've just asked everyone. It's a Patrick's Day. We should all be out drinking green cordial. <laughs> <laughs> That's a correct thing to say, my students. <laughs> yeah. Steve, oh, Steve's got his St. Patrick's Day shirt on. Yeah. Any questions? Sam, you've been dying to ask a question, haven't you? Was it uh huh? <laughs> or uh, did I get your name right? Yeah, you've been really longing to ask a question, haven't you? Right? No questions? Uh, would there be electric difference between the poles on the electromagnet from before? So this is from Cooper. So I think he's referring to the two, um, the balance there. Okay. One of the reasons uh, on the balance, one of the reasons we don't necessarily use a magnet here, we use two electromagnets, is that when we remove the current, there is no steel whatsoever, or generally no steel, a little bit of steel. And so we don't get any remnant magnetism. So if, if, for instance, you have a coil and you pass a current through and there's some steel there, you can partially magnetize the steel. And so when you turn the current off, you may still have a small amount of magnetism. In this case here, we don't have any steel, so it's two air coil magnets. So no, there is none. Thanks, Cooper. Thanks, Cooper. He said thanks. Oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you for saying thanks. <laughs> All right, so here's what we've got throughout the year. So we've got lots of exciting lecturers. We're going to try to gradually get people back into the theatre post-COVID because what we really want is you to actually do hands-on, come and touch these things and find out how they work and encourage you to actually think beyond what you're learning, because there is a danger. Yes, the world is digital. I'll tell you what the world is digital. When we talk about an electron inside an atom, inside a quantum device, its spin is either up or down. There's no in-betweenness. Well, there is in-betweenness for a short period of time. We, we don't know what happens. And so we do actually live in a, a really quantum digital world. We have very quantized states. The energies are or they're not. But it's a mistake to think that we're in this digital world because in this digital world of mobile phones where everything's an app, you're too abstracted from. We want you to, yep, question. I've got a question from Gaji, pretty much on that. It says, what devices are used to convert these analog mechanisms to digital things like phones and apps and okay. stuff? So in your phone, one of the most important devices is a crystal. There's crystals, right? Okay, now I want you. Okay, I'll go on the board and we'll have a look. So, actually, um, does anyone? Um, where's the? Um, <laughs> maybe, oh no, there we go. Okay. Does anyone? Anyone know what a barbecue is? Do you have to cook the barbecue at home? Yeah. Do you sometimes have to light the gas and you press the gas lighter and it lights? You seen those ones? 
Now, if you're very rich, you know, maybe you've got an electric one, but I've got this old one we have to push against this spring and it goes click and then it lights. Have you seen those ones? Do you know how they work? Well, they generate about 10,000 volts from that click. That's amazing. And so what there is in those barbecues, there is a crystal in the form of a piezo crystal, piezo crystal we call them. And we bend them. And when you bend them, you distort all of the interatomic lattices in that crystal and you change the potential and you get a very large voltage spike from that thing. So somehow if you stretch a crystal, you can change the internal arrangement of all the electrons in there and you can and you multiply that by Avogadro's number, you know, or whatever, how many um, molecules or atoms there are in that crystal, and you can get a large voltage. What you can also do is you can carefully cut a crystal into a cube. And on, on okay, so I'll just show the cube. And on this space and the back space, you can put some aluminium and actually measure a property of that crystal. And on this space and that space, you can also do the same thing. And on this space, that space, in other words, in X, Y, or Z in three dimensions. And what happens with that crystal is that, I have to always remember about this camera. I need a, <laughs> well, that crystal is when you move it, when you accelerate it, the crystal distorts ever so slightly. And when that distortion occurs, you get a faint little electrical signal. And that actually tells you about acceleration. And so the accelerometer in your phones is a tiny crystal in which you measure the distortion between X, Y, and Z of that device. Then there is a temperature measuring device. Then there's another thing called a magnetometer that detects a magnetic field. To give you a comparison, the Earth's magnetic field, I think, is half a gauss, is it, or something like that? It's a tiny amount, yes. Yeah. And, um, and and that's one uh, one half of 10,000 um, 10, gauss in a Tesla, so it's tiny, you know, compared to the synchrotron um, magnetic field. And those devices can detect that. What else have we got? We've got microphones, that's how the sound pressure meter works, sound, sound microphone in there. A light sensor. The light sensor actually in your phone is actually technically a camera, but they could actually have a resistor in the phone that actually is sensitive to light. And that that um, that's called an LDR, a light dependent resistor. But I think most phones they just use the camera to work out how much light intensity there is. Um, velocity, they use possibly the GPS signal. You could try. Um, to integrate a difference, I can't remember, big cellometer, but you can't get a good signal. But you could try to actually get the difference in GPS signals to actually get those measurements. What else can a phone measure? Are we there or? Um, Anything else yeah. a phone can measure? It can measure sound. Yeah? Mm. Yeah? Well, the sound the is microphone. measured with the microphone and processing that microphone, right? Okay. And by the way, um, you know, when it comes to um, sound itself is so exciting thing for you to understand. You all listen to music, but that music has been so processed. But the processing that occurs comes from a very fundamental, simple thing of physics. I suppose it's physics, we'll claim it's physics, the mathematicians will claim it's mathematics. And it's called Fourier, the Jean-Baptiste Fourier from 1800s, like 200 years ago, made this radical idea forward that any sound wave, any wave, any periodic disturbance can be made up out of the sum of sinusoidal disturbances. And that's how MP3s and MP4s all work. What about result. measuring distance? Distance, distance, tough one. Um, there's things called LIDAR, which is sort of like radar, one way of measuring, I can tell you, have you seen those beautiful old Polaroid films? You know, those old Polaroid cameras where you put a clip and then the, the picture would come out of the camera. They've been reinvented recently. They were the, the ants' pants in the 1980s. That's last century, you know? 
and you could then you'd have a photo and you'd shake it and rub it like that and then it would develop in front of your eyes. And you know how the focusing system on that worked? When you press click, it would send out a high frequency sound wave, ultrasound, that you can't hear. And sound travels at what speed? Somebody? In air? 340 meters per second. Thanks very much. And so if I do this, I've heard the reverberation come back to me straight away. But if I'm in a very large cabin, it takes time for the sound to come back and it takes a fraction of a second. But if I send a sound wave from me to Steve and it bounces back off Steve, that gets back to me in um, a couple of milliseconds. And so the camera would measure the amount of time it would take back to bounce off the subject and use that to calculate the focal thing to set the distance. However, in um, modern cameras now, the focus is set by actually optimizing the focus to give sharpness in the picture. And that's quite a complex process. And that's called, uh, you have to do a fast Fourier transform, which is beyond you guys to know. But it's like, it takes about 100 photos and works out, ah, that's the sharpest one. I'll give you that one. We good? Is the world digital or analog? It doesn't matter. All you have to do is understand it. Thanks for coming, guys. Steve said, I've always broke demos. Um, we're good. As I said, we've got some great lectures coming up for you um, in the next few weeks. Just watch the website and try to get people here.